and welcome to Dungeons and Drama Nerds. I'm Percy and I'm here with Todd. Hey there. And Nick. Hello. Today we are here to talk a little bit more in depth about the mechanics of paranoia and the way they help us tell stories in the game. As we said in our paranoia explainer, um, this game has a lot of humor and kind of this like offbeat um, weirdness to it. Uh, For example, um, one of the things that the designers think is really important for you to know is that sexuality is a different concern. Heterosexual sex is treasonous as it makes a mockery of the computer's extensive cloning facilities. The computer has no official stance on homosexual activity due to a lack of programming on the matter. It treats it as a form of enthusiastic wrestling that is inadvisable when traitors may be nearby. And so there's this very, like, weird, campy, tongue-in-cheek um, vibe that pervades both the player book and the GM handbook, um, which I think is delightful. And I was so excited when Ben um, brought this game to our attention. I had never heard of it before. I'm not sure about the two of you. Nope. Um But it's the sort of thing that blends very well with his like very online and sometimes sardonic um, humor uh, that I get to see a lot that doesn't hit the light of Twitter. Um, (laughs) And so it was just a really enjoyable um, blending of those two things, like his humor and the game's humor um, was something that I was really pumped about. I don't know why you're highlighting this passage about sexuality as a joke, because it is simply fact that heterosexual sex is treasonous. It's Sorry. true. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Treasonous both in the world of paranoia and on our podcast. Yes. yes. That's why Nick is always in jail. Um, it's true. You can't anyway. see this, but I'm <laughs> podcasting in from a penitentiary. Anyway, um... The, the the game also makes a very strong point of saying that humor is not a reason to be offensive. Like there is a difference between being funny and being crass even and like hurting the people that you're playing with. And I like that they go out of their way to say that, which like as a darkly comic horrific game, um, you could easily see them not doing something like that. I would love to actually read what they say about it, because I think it's a like really good instructional thing about clear rules writing and like clearly taking a stance on something in your art. They have a sidebar in the GM's handbook where they are talking about humor and respecting the people you're playing with. The sidebar is titled, I don't care about offending people. This is paranoia exclamation mark. And their response is I'm quoting in full. If you don't care about offending people, you're a dick. And the only people that like you are dicks like you. And we don't want to play games with you. And when you leave a room, decent people are like, can you believe that person? And they don't like you. So try being a better person, maybe. <laughs> End of sidebar. <laughs> and I just, like, I actually do. It's hilarious, first off. But I also do in a in an industry that is so full of people and games that are a little bit afraid to alienate large swaths of their players especially older players who have been invested in the system for a long time and then keep um you know sometimes very outdated and offensive things in the game i really admired that uh directness (laughs) yeah well this game and i think even even beyond explicitly like things like that i think the game itself like the world of alpha complex is kind of a send-up of a lot of the like it's not only a satire of like the world of social media and the and the digital world that we live in. Um, I think it's also making fun of a lot of the oppressive kind of structures that people kind of chafe against. Like, I think it is a really good tool for like, I don't know, like just making fun of shit that is annoying and terrible about our day to day life. Um, and it's humor about it, I think is really fun and tongue in cheek while also like taking on, I don't know, stuff that is hard, like imagining a future where our uh, world is ruled by robots. (laughs) Well, and very clearly a like punch up, not down ethos, Yeah, um, which I think is important always. Yeah. 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 It's a world that feels um, unfortunately kind of familiar, but it also is not like grim, dark and scary. It has a very lighthearted sense of humor that I really, really like. Um, and it is genuinely the funniest TTRPG handbook I've ever read. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's hard to, well, we'll talk about this a little more later, but uh, I think it's 
hard to do comedy and hor- hard to do horror in tabletop games, by which I mean it's hard to kind of bake them into the gameplay. It's very easy for like funny things to arise when we're playing, but it's harder to structurally like bake them into the game. Uh, but I think this game does a good job of it. Mm hmm. Um, One of my favorite things about paranoia is that contrary to, I think, our traditional understanding of a TTRPG where you like have a party and you're working together to accomplish a goal or like you're doing a thing together. um, Paranoia very explicitly from the beginning pits you against each other, which I think is really fun Um, rather than kind of like party versus everything else. The mechanics are very PVP, like it encourages competing with other people in your group it encourages selling other people in your party out to the computer if you find out that they have mutant powers or they're in a secret society um even in character creation you are actively fucking other people over uh in order to get the stats that you want um which i think is really interesting because it changes the way that you approach telling the story of the game um like it it video gamifies it in a way that i think is really interesting um can you say more about that percy i'm curious what you mean by like video gamifies it i'm thinking a lot about the achievement system but i'm also thinking like Mm -hmm. it it feels kind of like an mmo in some ways to me Mm -hmm. in terms of just like you as a player have an objective that might align with other players objectives but ultimately you are only concerned about what is beneficial to you um right like it feels it feels like a, it feels very kind of individualistic in some ways, even though you are playing with other people. Um, and I think that's an interesting dynamic in a TTRPG, given that we've previously explored two games that are really kind of all about like working together with a party to tell a story where you all have kind of one unified goal, even if you might have some objectives that are more individual. Yeah. And it's interesting. I think actually you saying that makes me realize that. A lot of tabletop games have swung kind of away from that by, for example, no longer offering individual experience awards uh, or doing away with like the idea of experience altogether. And Paranoia deliberately leans into that idea of like there there are, like you said, achievements that only one PC will get and then they have more XP (laughs) than the others. And that's what the game is kind of chock full of to promote that friction. Paranoia is the capitalism to D&D. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, and I think so, like we're recording this. a while after we played the campaign um and there are specific choices that like i made because it was like oh i could get a bunch of experience for that and like why not like i have no reason to do this dumb risky thing but i could get experience for it and other people could not get experience for it if i do it quicker um and so that motivated some of the things for my character as just a like yeah, let's get weird. Um, that otherwise I wouldn't like in a D and D campaign, I wouldn't have tried to like do a sweet flip over a chasm, even though I might think that's cool. That's like, yeah, or you could die. Yeah. You right. just have, you have clones for that. That's yeah. the whole point. Yeah. The stakes feel lowered in a way that is really freeing. And it's also like, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of fun to have a game where like you can kill your friends and like in the scheme of things, it doesn't matter because you have extra lives and like the point of the game is to dick each other over. Um, Like, I think that's kind of like, I think the game is more fun when you lean into like, oh, like I am an agent of the computer who is trying to sell everybody else out, which leads me into kind of a thing that I really love about the way that the handbook is written is that there's this emphasis on role play in a really explicit way that I think a lot of games don't explicitly name. Um, Like in the handbook, it talks a lot, especially in like the section where it talks about what happens when you lose it. It's like, you have to role play this way or like you, this is how you play whatever is happening to you. Um, Like it's using acting terminology, which I think is really cool Um, because I think not very many games that I've seen talk really explicitly about like what actually role playing is and how you act as a character um, in the context of the game. But this, this game is like really explicitly saying like, yeah, this is how, this is how a mechanic affects your role play. That leads us really neatly. I think into talking more specifically about 
uh, gameplay mechanics that kind of use that role play emphasis. Yeah, and that leads you to um, explore those PvP and paranoid aspects of the game pretty naturally, I think. Um, One that I want to talk briefly about, although you will not hear it um, in our podcast, is the initiative uh, system for combat, which in Paranoia, as it's written, is essentially a bluffing game, a little bit like uh, the card game Bullshit, where... Everybody who wants to go in a turn puts down a card that will give them a score and the GM starts counting down from 10. And at any point, somebody can be like, oh, that's my score. I have nine. So I'm going to go now. But any of the other players can say, that's bullshit. I don't believe you have a nine um, and attempt to call them out on it. And if I'm remembering correctly, if they're correct, then the player who bluffed loses their turn and if they're incorrect the player who called them out uh Mm -hmm. loses their turn now you won't hear that in our podcast because we recorded this during the COVID 19 pandemic um so we had no easy way to all physically sit around a table and handle decks of cards and so on um but i did think that kind of initiative system was interesting and fun and a good way to promote kind of like rapid fire gameplay and also screwing over your friends Mm. yeah there are a whole bunch of cards in in paranoia that we some of them we kind of and we'll talk about this more in an upcoming episode but some of them we simply translated to emails um, and some of them we just kind of dispensed with entirely because there's no good way to do action cards when you don't have a physical table to put cards down on Um, but i think that's also really cool Um, and the whole game of paranoia is um explicitly designed to be something that you could like set up and start playing in half an hour yeah another thing that i like about the combat system going back to the earliest versions of the game is that like it's five seconds where you need to pick what you're doing um and so in a very specifically anti-war gaming tradition they're like yeah i don't care if you have 30 spell cards that you're gonna think about going through it if you don't make a choice in the next literal real world five seconds, your character is going to spend the next round thinking about what they're doing <laughs> and they might get shot. Uh, and Honestly, so it like focuses on keeping you on your f- toes and like going for something. I tear up my play by mail campaign of paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that I think adds to the whole, um, energy of the game and the paranoia and the kind of spontaneity is that the gm uh never rolls dice unless they say in the book you really really want to Um, (laughs) and if you love rolling dice they will not stop you but much like powered by the apocalypse games um they suggest that god doesn't roll dice and neither should you because that keeps the players kind of in the center of the narrative and gives the GM a little more flexibility and a little more nimbleness to kind of respond in the moment and keep things um, going. And the other thing that pairs with that is that they also tell the GM very clearly the result of the players rolling dice should never be nothing. And this is a tabletop ethos that more and more I want to bring into games that don't have it because Mm -hmm. I get very tired sometimes when I'm playing other games and I'm like, oh my God, there's these long sections where just like nothing significant happens. But as they they say about mutant powers in this game, you know, players can use mutant powers and they might succeed or they might not. But mutant powers never fizzle. They either work or they go catastrophically wrong. And I think that's just a really good way to both amp up the the humor of the game and the kind of extremity of it and also keep the story moving in a really interesting way. So every dive roll actually does push things forward. I'm going to bring us into the weeds of this a little bit only because I think it's interesting to think because I'm thinking of the number of times I've been in a D&D game as the DM where like the players are on like a they're, they're just like really invested in something that I didn't put any prep into or they're like really, really into like opening every single compartment of a trunk or whatever is mm-hmm. a bad example but you know what i mean if, like one of those situations where you're just like there's nothing here please understand that there's nothing that this is a, there's nothing to be gained from continuing to investigate this thing 
Um, the chair is just a chair. <laughs> um, you can roll as many times as you want, but you will not find anything. Um, but I think it's interesting that this paranoia and apocalypse world two games where you don't roll as often as you might roll in like D and D or Pathfinder. And I think that contributes that helps when the game only mandates you to roll for something, when it actually like will matter. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I actually, I think the lower stakes help in it too, in some ways, because I mean, for me, even less so than narratively, the place I get frustrated in some other games is um, I had an instant in a, 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 an experience in a game I was jamming the other night of a uh, Pathfinder where it was like I felt like this combat was just dragging on and I was kind of artificially speeding things along to get through it. And I was like, man, is this game much harder than I've realized or something? And then I looked back. We were playing online so I could scroll back through the old dice rolls and I was like, oh, no, this is just... It's just a run of bad luck. None of the PCs have rolled above a like eight on their Oof. like D20 rolls to hit in the last couple of turns. So like, but the result of that is not disaster. It's just it takes longer to win. And that's mm-hmm. boring. And I like the, you know, the lower stakes means that it can be like, oh, you tried this thing. And not only did you fail, but also you like fell and lost your arm to the paper shredder. Mm-hmm. And like that at mm-hmm. least is interesting. That's like a new mm-hmm. interesting thing that has happened in the game in a way that you swung your sword, you missed is just not. Well, I wonder um, as we segue into like clones and multiple lives and how that changes stakes. Um, I wonder if part of the problem with like d and Pathfinder is that your characters normally must survive everything and so all encounters are like how well and how quickly they dispatch a foe whereas this like you can fail spectacularly and die and be interesting but like it is often considered ungamesmanlike to like have your party die um, especially in a situation where like they shouldn't like they shouldn't mm-hmm. because of poor dice rolls die to a right. pack of goblins. That would be embarrassing and demoralizing for them or something. Well, I think it's also um, I think it's like it takes like a solid two hours to build a and d character and get all of the details right. It takes like 15 minutes to put a paranoia character together and totally, probably about yeah. the same amount of time as it. Apo- so like your investment as a player is less in your specific character and more in the game and the experience, which I think mm. is really cool and important, which is not to say that like getting really into your character is a bad thing. Cause like, that's great. Um, however, <laughs> Um, But I think it allows, like, in Paranoia, having a backup of somewhere between, like, three and five clones um, after the one you're currently on is, like, it allows you to take risks that when you're like, I only have this one life and if I fail three death saving throws, it's over or my party needs to go on, like, a huge quest to revive me and I need to do something else in the interim um, is a very different thing. And I think, like, D&D tries to make death meaningful but also something that you rarely encounter as a player Mm -hmm. Um, and i think paranoia instead is saying like it's absurd it's meaningless and it's going to happen all the time Um, and i think that dramatically shifts the way players engage with different encounters and different things i think it has to do with genre as well like you Mm -hmm. just said todd dnd wants death to be a significant event um even if you can come back from death it wants it to be like serious and thinking about comedy um one of one of my teachers Catherine Sheehy um uh that I just took a course on comedy with says of comic characters that they have to be like built to take it and Mm. you know in the world of kind of traditional media you could look at something like cartoons as one extremity of that where you know the great thing about a cartoon character for comedy is you can do anything to them you can squash them flat you can blow them up like whatever and clones i feel like are sort of the tabletop role-playing game version of that the there's so much more room for comedy because if your character gets blown up by you know because they crossed the wrong wires and then an anvil fell on them or whatever, uh, you know, that doesn't matter as much when 
you have those backup clones, like you said. So that mm-hmm. creates the kind of space for comedy because the characters can be abused a lot more by the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I think um, something else that like feeding into this idea of PvP and like backstabbing and betraying um, the people that you're playing with, um, a thing that they bake in um, in at least the most recent version is this idea of devenge. Um, and so when your clone dies and a new clone is being shipped to your party um, through like hydraulic tubes or what have you, um, they're given a lung full of this drug called Devenge, which dissipates all feelings of revenge and like death dealing. And so uh, it's giving you a narrative reason to not have your party collapse into a bunch of like, you're a traitor, you're a traitor, you're a traitor, you're a traitor until you're all out of clones. Um, which I think is like fun and silly. Yeah. It feels like, like that, like cartoony slapstick humor is really the vibe of, of this game that is intended to be really fast paced. And like, it's definitely not the kind of game where you're supposed to be like, Oh, I investigate the hallway for 10 minutes to see right. and figure out if there's any, like you just, you just do the thing. Cause yeah, ultimately like even in the, um, in the way that you can, as a player attempt to justify using a certain skill for something, even if it doesn't necessarily on the surface, make a lot of sense that feels low stakes to me too. Um, in a similar way where it's just like, yeah, I don't know, like do whatever you want. Like <laughs> as long as you can hash it out with your GM, like I, I don't care, do what you want, <laughs> which I think is, is a cool kind of attitude for the game to have in a, in a similar vein to the kind of general, like don't be a dick advice that the GM handbook offers to you. The GM guide also makes it very clear that while friend computer may be cruel and arbitrary, you, the GM, are not. Uh, Your goal is to make sure that everybody's having a good time, even if it is friend computer's job to be unknowable and a little trigger happy and make things harder for the player characters. I think that's always a really good thing for handbooks to name of just like, you know, you, you have a role outside of your in the game role, and that's to ensure that like the group of people that you are playing a game with are having fun. Mm -hmm. And it goes out of the way to say that you also should be having fun, which I Mm -hmm. think a lot of older, especially like wizard of the coasty stuff um, doesn't is that like, there's a lot of people who feel that your job as dungeon master is to like make an enjoyable experience for everyone, but you. And I like that this is like, no, you're playing. Like you're not performing for your group, you're playing with them. And so like have a good time with them. I actually think the the GM guide from the Paranoia starter set, which I was rereading over the last couple of days, is really absolutely full of excellent advice for GMing just in general. It's one of the better GM guides I think I've read for any tabletop product um i don't know yeah they just cover everything from like don't be a jerk to how to improvise like it's it's got a lot of good stuff in there well i think it's cool and i think i think to some extent i would call paranoia very much like a gm's game Mm. um because it it really empowers you to just like run with whatever silly bullshit you want to do um, and it really gives you a lot of power to shape the world for the for the PC is like there's a lot of published content about what alpha complex is, but ultimately you don't have to use any of it and you can put whatever you want in and you have this really cool like the ultimate NPC, which is friend computer, like a an all knowing, all powerful being. Well, and there's a there's a note in the second edition that I was reading that I enjoyed where it was like your players are going down corridors that you don't want them to go down. Luckily, friend computer can shut those down. (laughs) Friend computer (laughs) can remind them that they need to do that thing that you told them to do. Otherwise they will be die. (laughs) Like they will die as traitors. Yeah, like the benefit of creating a game in which like everybody is kind of encouraged to be antagonistic towards each other uh, is that you get to be antagonistic to your players and everybody has opted into it. So it's not Mm. you being an asshole. It's, um, well, hopefully it's not you being an asshole because you were warned not to and you'll get trees and stars for doing so. Um, but, you know, like you you're encouraged by the game to uh, like pull tricks that you ordinarily shouldn't be able to because you get to be in control of an omniscient, uh, all powerful being, which is, I think, 
secretly every GM's dream. I think the dynamic that it sets up is very interesting, both in terms of like just the tone of the game and the stories that you can tell with it. Um, I think it leads to these very madcap um, sorts of encounters and experiences that like Percy, as you were saying, um, you found this playbook like really enjoyable and funny to read. Um, I remember when we were preparing to play, I was reading some of it out loud for my roommates and I was like, we have to play this game as like our group because our group would go nuts over some of the stuff that happens in this. Um, and it would be way less like much lower stakes than our D and D campaign that's been running for three years and that we have all this investment in and like people have storylines that they want to pursue. And this could be like, your storyline is like, I don't know. You're a weird clone. <laughs> don't die. Here's a gun. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that that's very releasing and allows us to tell, um, more like wacky and absurd stories that I feel like a lot of TTRPGs kind of stray away from. Like, I feel like so many of them are power fantasies in one way or another. And this is so clearly like you're ill-equipped, you're uninformed, and you're probably going to die. What are you going to do? Um, and I think that's just such a different tone. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think I would, I would, I'll make a leap and I'll say something bold that might not actually be that bold, um, which is, I don't think this is like, I mean, I don't think this is a game where you're telling like an epic and compelling story. I think this is a game where you have madcap adventures and it's a game about relationships in a very different way to the way that apocalypse world is a game about relationships. Um, <laughs> Cause I think this is about not only what is your relationship to the computer and what role play interactions are you, do you get to have with the GM who's playing as the computer, but also, you know, yeah. How are you interacting you know, how are you trying to suss out who's in a secret society in your party? Um, and how are you actively trying to make yourself look better than your compatriots to the computer? And you know, like, I think as long as you as a group of players are willing to really buy into, into the, the bit of the, of the whole game, which is this all powerful computer bit. Um, there's so much like fun to be had doing that, but you're certainly not going to tell like a, you know, a layered and multifaceted and, and deep tale of adventure. I want to riff on something you said, Percy, and say something equally bold, not for its insight, but for its abuse of the English language, <laughs> um, which is that I feel like if Apocalypse World gamifies relationships, then paranoia, interestingly, like relationalizes the game. By which I mean, told you, uh, <laughs> I told me you more. it would be an abuse of the English language. But what I mean is um, Apocalypse World and a lot of Powered by the Apocalypse games are very interested in kind of like tracking the relationship. You know, that's the Hick score in Apocalypse World. And what I love about Paranoia's setup is it actually functions on creating that feeling but actually at the table between the players mm -hmm. with all of these systems where, you know, you don't get to pick all of your characters stats. Half of them are determined by the arbitrariness of who sat next to you and what they wanted. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it works to kind of like pull those actual tensions into the game in the GM's handbook. Another thing you won't hear because it involves physical cards, but uh, the computer chooses a number one troubleshooter when somebody does something to impress it. And the GM is supposed to hand that player a little card that says number one troubleshooter on it in big letters. And it looks very happy and exciting. And they say in the handbook, you know, if you can, if you have a little like standy to put the card in, do that. So that's like sitting in front of that player and that player will feel great. And then if they ever mess anything up, take it away from them and as soon as you can like give it to somebody else for doing something moderately well and just like keep that moving so it's a lot of the game is about actually creating particular feelings at the table that then get fed into the comedy and the the kind of madcap mayhem in the narrative rather than the other way around yeah, I think it's cool that they've built a vessel where it's completely like OK and safe to do that thing that like sows a lot of resentment and bad feelings among the group because you're operating in this space where like, you know, it, it's jokes time and we're all having fun. 
Yeah, I do think you you have to play this game with a bunch of people who are all on the same page. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> like Nobody. I I felt really great about our game um that we played despite not having played games with um all of the people that we played with um because we like laid out like feelings and vibes about what we were doing but this is the sort of game that i want to play with all of my friends at my dnd table and not like a bunch of randos at like packs unplugged um, yeah i'm not rolling up to my, <laughs> to my friendly local game store for friday night paranoia with strangers yeah yeah i think it relies so heavily on a like shared history away from the table and at the table um of like I feel fully empowered to like reference like shit that I make fun of my friend for all the time um and pull that into the, like I think you can make it personal in a way that doesn't feel harmful if you're playing it with people who you are really good friends with yeah cool great well that's it done <laughs> <laughs> Dungeons and Drama Nerds is produced by Todd Brian Backus, Percy Hornack, and Nick Orvis, and is mixed and edited by Anthony Sertel Dean. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at DN Drama Nerds and on Facebook at Dungeons and Drama Nerds. For cast bios, head to our website, DungeonsandDramaNerds.com. Tune in next week as we continue saving 73 JPEGs I desperately need. Dungeons and Drama Nerds.